All right, guys, what's up? We're, today we're going to be going over meniscus tears or meniscal tears, however we want to address it. And so these are super important to know for the boards because remember part of the unhappy triad is ACL, MCL, and then medial meniscus because that's where the ACL and MCL kind of insert into all that can be torn traumatically. So this is one of those big three. The boards might quiz you on the unhappy triad. Um, we just got to make sure we're aware of that. So let's get into our meniscal tears specifically. So anatomy of the menisci. So the medial meniscus is right here. And this is more firmly attached to the tibia. And this is also the one that's more likely to be injured. So if it's between the medial meniscus or the lateral meniscus, the medial one is the one that's probably going to have the injury, either a traumatic injury, or as we're gonna learn in a little bit, a lot of times meniscal tears happen due to degeneration of the cartilage, because remember the meniscus are kind of like that cushion, that shock absorption kind of thing. As we age, the shock absorption goes down and down and down. So then we end up having some degenerative tears in the meniscus. Now the lateral meniscus, it's less common to have an injury on the lateral meniscus. And this is just due to the way that people end up usually injuring themselves and due to the um, other ligaments that end up attaching here. So you can see that the ACL is over here. And so we can see that that attaches into the medial meniscus. That's why with the unhappy triad, we're gonna get part of that not pictured in here, the uh, MCL would be over here because it's on the medial side because here's our, here's a good way to figure it out. Here's our, here's our fibula over here. So that's our lateral side. So our medial side here, that's why we end up having an injury there. Lateral meniscus, less common, but we still got to understand how to test for it and then what it would look like if we had a lateral meniscus tear. Now here is a key thing and I want you guys to jot this down pause the podcast. If you're driving and listening to this as a podcast, keep driving, just listen to it later when you have time to write this down. But here's the thing when it comes to the anatomy of the menisci in this picture I have over here. So anybody watching this on a video can see this. Anybody who's listening cannot, but there is what is called a white zone on the inside of the menisci. And then there is a red zone on the outside of the menisci. And what does that mean? Well, let me tell you. The outer one third of the meniscus is vascularized, which means that there's blood flowing to this area. It's getting constant nourishment. It's getting replenished all the time. Nutrients are coming in. So the outer one third can heal spontaneously by itself without surgical intervention. So if somebody has a tear to the outside of the meniscus, the outer one third, which is the red zone because there's blood flowing into it and it works, um, they can heal with conservative PT management. So just general strengthening, range of motion, all that stuff, they can be okay. Now, here's the thing. The inner two thirds of the meniscus is not vascularized, meaning that surgical intervention would be needed in the event of a tear. So this is super important to know. The outside of the meniscus can be spontaneously healed and everything's okay while the inside is the part that cannot be healed on its own because there is no blood flow to the area. That's why it's called the white zone because there's not active blood vessels flowing through there. So this is super important to understand because the boards will quiz you on this and be like, what part is vascularized? Which part isn't? Which one's more likely to be injured? Which one's not? Menial meniscus, more likely to be injured than the lateral. And then we'll have the outer one third of the meniscus having blood to it. Then the inner one third of the menis the inner two thirds of the meniscus is not vascularized. So how I like to think of this is that you have like a pretty like club, pretty building. Everybody who like the outside of the building is like super flashy, pretty, everything that looks like it's kept up to date and everything. You're like, wow, this is awesome. That's our vascularized kind of part of the meniscus. But then we go inside like the building or the club or whatever, and it's dead in there. And it's like, ew, what the heck is going on? It's like grungy from frat house kind of basement looking thing. That's how I like to think of it because the inside is the part that cannot heal itself. The outside has all that blood flow, that flashiness, that nutrients. That's how I think of it. If that helps you remember this, awesome. Love that for you. If that just made you confused, ignore everything I just said. So that's the anatomy of the menisci. Super important for understanding how we're going to approach treatment because it depends on where the tear is, what's going on, and which menisci is injured. That's going to help dictate what's going on with our specific special tests. Now, etiology. How does one tear their menisci? Well, 
in the same way, usually a lot of people end up tearing their ACL or MCL in the unhappy triad, uh, usually due to a twisting injury after planting. That's a main common one, can still be with traumatic falls and stuff like that. This is usually due to young people doing any sort of sports where there's cutting, like soccer, basketball, um, lacrosse, field hockey, all of that stuff, just that plant and twist kind of thing. Football's a big one too. That would be a traumatic injury, more common in younger people. Now this can also occur due to some sort of hyperflexion injury. So like a very like deep aggressive squat landing on their knees while they're bent. Maybe they're like diving for a ball or something in soccer, or like they took a weird land in gymnastics or something. Um, these can all cause a meniscus tear. Cause remember the meniscus is that shock cushioning kind of thing. And it's most like easily traumatized with bending because here's the thing we're also going to notice with the meniscus when we have a meniscal injury it's going to be that locking or clicking those are keywords guys the locking and clicking so understanding that a lot of times with older adults though on the other hand so we already went over our traumatic ways we can mess it up over time because older adults everything's breaking down that's just how the, the cookie crumbles essentially they end up crumbling um the meniscus ends up crumbling as well so the meniscal cartilage and everything starts to degenerate. Then we start seeing tears with that grinding down and everything. And that's where we get our patients that are like, it's bone on bone because the meniscus has been completely degenerated. So you're going to see that this is why a lot of individuals I'm getting also knee replacements, not just with the osteoarthritis, the meniscus isn't working anymore. And when we have a knee replacement, we get rid of the meniscus and we make this nice, shiny, smooth surface for it to glide on and be shock absorbed. So that's another thing that we see going on with our older adults. Now, remember the unhappy triad. This is important. Make sure we know this ACL, MCL, medial meniscus. You can have an injury where you just, all of it's gone. <laughs> all of it's snapped. Not fun definitely can all occur with that traumatic twisting, planting impact from the, like an outside hit in like football where they're like diving at their knees, kind of hitting the outside of their knee that can easily cause all of this not good, but that is how you would get a meniscal tear. So what does it look like? As I said before, a sudden onset of symptoms that we would see, and I'm have the symptoms down below a sudden onset of symptoms would be more likely due to a sports injury seen in younger individuals. This is going to be key because you're going to see like, it might be a younger person who did X, Y, Z, what's probably going on. Traumatic meniscal tear, possibly degeneration in older adults will end up being a slow onset of symptoms. So again, they'll start randomly starting to notice that clicking, that swelling kind of thing going on at their knee, that's where they'll start seeing that. Now, a big one that we're gonna see is just general instability of the knee. And that's because of the meniscus is like cushioning kind of shock absorption kind of uh, function. If we start to lose that, it gets a little slippery and starts to um, get a little bit loose and we don't want a loose knee, not ideal. And then if we start seeing weakness of the surrounding knee musculature, this is due to the fact that it's not supporting the meniscus as much and that we're going to start seeing other instability problems at the knee, clicking, buckling, all that stuff. That's kind of what's happening also with the meniscus. Now, what are some hallmark signs that regardless of who we're looking at, whatever the boards is saying, we're going to see the locking and catching or clicking at the knee. So any of those words, locking, catching, clicking, some sort of sensation like that at the knee, we're thinking meniscus. Like that's one of the things like the patients are saying it's clicking and it's different than crepitus. Crepitus is crunchy. This is just a random, like not kind of things. I'm not, not like, you know, the crunchy knees with the crepitus it's different. So that's how you can kind of start to know the patient might start complaining of decreased range of motion. They're not able to bend down as much without hearing that clicking, that popping, that pain kind of thing going on at the knee or that, that like catching kind of thing. And they'll start complaining of that. They're also going to have pain and tenderness around the joint itself. So sometimes you might see edema, especially if it's an acute injury, like with a younger person, they'll be like, man, it really hurts like around like the outside of my knee, like around the joint line is like the main part where you would start seeing that. So like right above like the tibial plateau, everything on the, like kind of towards the front of the knee also as well. Really, they just start complaining. It's clicking and it kind of hurts. That's kind of what we're seeing. And then also for the board specifically, there's three special tests that will test for a meniscal tear. You would have either a positive McMurray test, Apley's compression test, or positive Thessaly test. And I'm going to go over those special tests real quickly, just so then you guys are aware of like what that is. But those are the three special tests that test for meniscus. And it's important that we as PTAs know like what test is for what, because we're going to open a chart 
if we look at the chart and it says their Lockmans was negative, but they had a positive McMurray's test, what does that mean? Well, that means we don't think that they have an ACL tear, but we think that they might have a meniscal tear. So that's why we have to know because then we have to kind of be aware of like what's going on and we can expect to see that clicking and stuff like that at the knee. And then we need to be able to read the chart once we get it from the PT because the PT will probably be performing all these special tests and stuff like that. We need to know how to do them as well because if we have a patient coming in with all of a sudden a new sudden onset of symptoms, we as PTAs need to assess the situation and be like, what's going on? Um, and then kind of check out from there. So it's important that we know these special tests, even though most of the time we will not be performing them. We need to know them. The boards is gonna quiz you on them. We need to know what's going on. The boards is gonna be more like, here's the test. It was positive or negative. What does that mean? It's not gonna go through a whole thing of how to specifically test for the test. They might do that with some of the shoulder ones, but generally the boards is more like, you got this positive result. What does it mean kind of thing? So don't stress out too much if you don't understand how to perform the special test. It's more important to understand what they're testing. So let's get into those. The Apley's compression test, what you're gonna do is the patient's prone, they're gonna bend their knee up to 90. You're gonna kind of hold the like distal femur with your hand, and then you're gonna take your other hand, and you're gonna put it on top of like their heel kind of foot area. You're gonna kind of press the um, distal, the proximal tibia into like the distal femur, and you're gonna kind of press in as you manually laterally rotate the compressed tibia. So I have a picture here. I would suggest if you are listening to this on the podcast, just look, look it up on YouTube. There's these two guys. I think they are a uh, physio tutor is what their name is. They're really good at doing all these special tests on people and explaining what they are. But essentially what happens with a positive Apley's compression test is because you're compressing the meniscus and you're turning that's going to cause some clicking or pain if it would be a positive result. So that's what's going on with the Apley's compression test. Now the McMurray test is more commonly used to test for a meniscal tear. This is our second special test we'll go over. Patients in supine, the physical therapist or assistant is going to move the knee into a 90-90 position at the hip and the knee. And what they're kind of same way you would like kind of bend a like knee for a knee replacement kind of thing to stretch them out. To test the medial meniscus, they are going to rotate the tibia laterally. And then to test the medial meniscus, they're going to rotate. Oh no, to test the medial meniscus, they're going to rotate laterally. To test the lateral meniscus, they're going to rotate medially. So whichever way they're rotating is the opposite meniscus that we are testing. And this is just due to the locking and uh, screw home mechanism of the knee itself of why we're seeing this. So as they rotate the tibia, let's say they're testing the medial meniscus because that's the one that's most common. So if they're testing the medial meniscus, we're rotating the tibia laterally and we're extending the knee. Now, positive test result would be the same thing we're seeing in general, that clicking or locking or pain. So the clicking, locking pain, all of that should be red flags in the air being like meniscus, meniscus, meniscus. So McMurray is probably one of the most common, move knee up to 90, 90, externally rotate the tibia in order to test the medial meniscus. Lateral would be to rotate medially. Most of the time we're testing for the medial meniscus though, cause that's a more common one as you're extending the knee out. So last special test is a Thessaly test. Thessaly test is so easy to do. This is the one that we were doing most of the time with our patients uh, when I was, uh, my CI was a PT. So this is the one I saw the most. You're gonna stand on one foot, like a little flamingo. You're gonna bend your knee backwards. You're going to rotate to the side and then you're going to rotate to the other side. So you're gonna rotate in a, man in a manner that kind of twists the knee over. The knee should twist over the foot. Then it should twist back the other way over the foot. So the torso and the leg are gonna rotate side to side. Any, and you wanna do that at least three times each side. Positive test would be any sort of pain on the joint line or clicking. So again, one of those things, if the patient cannot <laughs> stand on one foot, this might not be the test for them, um, but if they are and it's like an athlete or something, you can kind of easily see, okay, is something going on? Because remember that twisting mechanism, if you notice all of these tests, they twist the tibia. Twisting the tibia starts to bring out any sort of problems with the meniscus. So we're just twisting the tibia in any sort of way, we're probably testing for a meniscus. So Thessaly, I like to think Thessaly twist. McMurray is the one where we are supine and then <laughs> We go up, twist, and out. That's how I think of it for McMurray. Then Apley compression is the one where we're pushing actually on the foot. So I like to think Thessaly twist, compre the Apley compression, we're pushing in while they're in prone. 
So push prone kind of thing. And then McMurray is like the most common meniscus one. So McMurray meniscus, that's how I like to remember that one. I know that there's other M ones, but it's got two M's for the meniscus and it tests both medial and lateral meniscus. And that one's in supine where you come up, you twist and then you press out. So special tests are very important at the knees and the shoulder, because these are the ones that we're going to be tested on the most. Cause these are the ones that are going to show up most in clinical practice and most on the board. So important we understand this. Now, how are we treating somebody with a meniscal uh, injury? So again, if it's the inner two thirds of the meniscus, cause remember we get into the party and we're like, oh man, this sucks in here. Like this is gross, like ew, frat house kind of thing. We'll need surgery to fix it. So we need major renovations to fix the inside because the outside can renovate itself. So inner two thirds of the meniscus, we're probably going to need some sort of surgical intervention to either have a meniscectomy, a partial meniscectomy where we actually surgically remove part of the meniscus, or we're going to make sure that we're going to repair it if it's able to be repaired. And here's the thing, when you have a protocol for a meniscal tear and it's been repaired and everything, generally you are not able to squat past parallel with this patient for at least six months due to the fact that that hyper flexion kind of thing is the main thing that's causing the clicking the problems. Patients might notice they're okay bending down to like 60 degrees, but then they get to like 80, 90 and they're like, oh, I'm getting this clicking. That's kind of why just to the nature of we bent too much and now this is torn. That's kind of what we're seeing, but we can conservatively manage a meniscal tear if it's to the outer one third of the meniscus. So we're saying, oh, we got all these pretty lights outside the building. We're good. Conservative management to the meniscus. So what we can do with that, just general lower extremity strengthening, kind of strengthening all the muscles around the knee, similar to how we would for somebody who's having a pre-op kind of physical therapy for when they're going to have a knee replacement, something just to get everything stronger again, to kind of strengthen those muscles to pull that pressure off of the meniscus itself to allow for the meniscus to spontaneously heal itself due to the fact that the outside of the meniscus is vascularized. So that's what we're doing for, um, an, a meniscal tear on the outer side, on the outside part of the meniscus. Now be careful because usually the meniscus isn't messed up by itself. Usually it's got friends that are messed up, which include the ACL and MCL. So especially if it's a traumatic injury, be careful with that because remember there's different protocols for ACL, MCL, generally with ACL up to six weeks, we're not doing any open chain knee extension. So no long arc quads, no knee extension machine, nothing along those lines. That's kind of what's going on with the ACL. And then you might have weight bearing restrictions for that as well. So just kind of be careful because the meniscus doesn't get hurt by itself. Usually it's got friends that get hurt along with it, like the ACL and MCL. So this is kind of a super important thing to notice. Uh, another thing that we want to do is just when we have a patient, especially if it's somebody who's on the conservative management because they injured the outside of their meniscus, um, palliative care, such as modalities, a lot of times the board's going to ask you about ultrasound to the meniscus. Um, you can do that. Uh, understanding that um, you can use like ice, heat to help with pain and stuff like that. Generally, if we're going to have a question about modalities used on a meniscal tear, it's going to be e-stim or it's going to be ultrasound. They love ultrasound on the boards. If you don't understand your ultrasound in and out with all the parameters, I would get on that right now, especially if you're taking the boards in um, April at the time of this recording. So main goal for in general with meniscal tears, decrease swelling, restore range of motion, increase strength, and just tell them don't hurt themselves in the future. So edu patient education on how to make sure we're strengthening, proprioceptive awareness, avoiding any sort of things that are going to injure it in the future. If it's a person who's a little bit older, who is uh, having that degenerative changes, encourage them to continue with strengthening and keeping up with stuff so then they don't further tear their meniscus in the future. So Keywords, everybody. We got the inner two thirds is non vascularized, which means we might need surgical intervention. Outer one third is vascularized, so we can have conservative management and treat that. Any sort of pos positive McMurray, Thessaly, or Apley's compression test, meniscus. If you're seeing that, they literally might ask you a question saying the patient has a positive McMurray test. What's messed up? And they'll give you like, they'll give you meniscus, ACL. MCL and LCL. That's what they'll give you. And they'll be like, what is it? And they might do that about those other special tests. They might say they have a positive valgus stress test. What's that? That's MCL. Lockman's, ACL. 
Vera stress test, that would be LCL. They're going to ask, they're literally, they might just ask a question like that, just to quiz you on it. And then understand that a meniscal injury can be that twisting and planting injury and could be degeneration older adults. And bonus on this slide that I have mentioned a lot, but should also be a very big keyword blaring in your face, clicking, locking, catching, pain at the joint line. All of that stuff, big, big, big meniscus. That's what we're thinking when it comes to that. So guys, sample question. All right, this is a long one. A physical therapist assistant is examining the results of their patient's MRI. The results state that there is a lesion to the inner two thirds of their meniscus. The patient states that they have already discussed their results with their physician and would like to know why the physician stated that they needed surgery. What is the rationale we should use to educate this patient? One, tell them that their physician is wrong and this type of tear can be treated with conservative management. Two, explain to the physician that you cannot discuss this topic with them. Oh no, explain to the patient that you cannot discuss this topic with them and that they should call their physician. Three, explain to the patient that the inner part of the meniscus is not vascularized and therefore cannot heal itself. Or four, explain to the patient that the inner part of the meniscus is vascularized and that surgery will help restore a blood flow to the area. So I hope you guys are listening and you know the answer already, but I'll give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so the answer is number three, explain to the patient that the inner part of the meniscus is not vascularized and therefore cannot heal itself. So let's kind of go through these, um, let's kind of go through why this is the correct answer. So let's, let's look at our key things. The patient has had an MRI that will determine soft tissue damage, meniscus, ACL, MCL, all that stuff. The results state that there's a lesion to the inner two thirds of their meniscus. Okay, so generally, we're not reading MRIs. So if we can see that the results are already saying that this is what's going on, somebody else, a radiologist and the physician have already kind of looked at this and kind of determined what's going on. Um, the patient states that they have already discussed the results with their physician. Okay. So this means that we are, we don't have to do the diagnosis part. They've already talked to them. They know what's going on. The patient's coming back saying, yo, I was at my doctor's office and this is what they said. And so the physician stating that they need surgery, the patient wants to know why. Now I want you guys to understand that they've already talked about it with their physician. They already have the results. They are, the physician has told them that they might need surgery and they're asking you why we, that is within our scope of practice to explain why we, the surgeon might be thinking what they're thinking, because a lot of times our patients come to us and they don't even know what's going on with them. And we kind of have to explain. So understanding that, why would we need to explain this to the patient? And that this is within our scope of practice to educate them on potential surgeries that they might be experiencing rationale for having certain surgeries, the recovery process, kind of what would happen during the surgery. That's within our scope of practice to kind of explain kind of to the patient what's going on with their own body. And so since they've already talked to their physician, we're not diagnosing it. We're not being the first one to explain things because sometimes a patient will come in and say, here's my x-rays, but I haven't talked to my doctor yet. And you see that there's clearly like a fracture to like, I don't know, their fifth and met head. You can't, you can't, you can't tell them. You got to let the doctor do that, but they've already talked to their doctor. So this is totally within our scope of practice to explain what's going on. So that means number two is out. Then number two says, explain to the patient that you can't discuss this topic with them. They should call their physician. They already talked to their physician. Do they want to have a follow-up with them again to ask more questions? Sure. They can definitely ask them more questions, but it's within our scope of practice that we can kind of explain the rationale for this. Number one, telling them that their physician is wrong and this type of tear can be treated with conservative management. Well, let's look. It's the inner two thirds of the meniscus that is not vascularized. Generally, if the surgeon is suggesting surgery, we kind of have to kind of be like, okay, there might be a reason why let's look into this. Okay. That's why, because it's not going to heal itself. That's kind of what's going on. We can explain that to the patient kind of what's going on and that yes, this kind of tear will not be healing on its own. That is why the surgeon is suggesting surgery. That's why number three is the correct answer. Explaining to the patient. So sitting them down, you can pull out the picture. You can pull out this PowerPoint if you really want to and be like, Hey, um, look, this part of the meniscus is vascularized, which means it can heal itself, but your tear is in here. This is a part of the meniscus that can't heal itself. So in order to fix it, 
the sur that's why we the surgeon suggesting surgery because it's not going to heal on its own because look all the blood's out here and it's not getting to here. So it's just going to stay torn the entire time. So you can educate the patient in that way. I pull out my complete anatomy on my iPad and I show patients all the time what's going on. They love it. But then they ask even more questions like, what's that? What's that? What's that? And I'm like, okay, let's, let's move on to something else. But um, yeah, you definitely that's within your scope to educate the patient of what's going on, especially even as a physical therapist assistant. I was sitting in there, the doctor's office with the podiatrist today, just talking to him. And I was explaining to somebody what exactly is Raynaud's because he was like, I'm pretty sure you got Raynaud's. So surgeon, had, the doctor had already said that. And then the patient's looking at me and being like, can you explain that in normal people terms? That's within our scope. It's fine. We're in our lane because they've already been diagnosed. That's why it's okay for us to explain what their diagnosis is. And then explain to the patient that the inner part of the meniscus is vascularized and that surgery will help restore blood flow to the area. That was the answer number four. Number four is definitely wrong because the inside of the meniscus is not vascularized um, and that the surgery is not to help restore blood flow to the area because there's no blood flow to the area in general. The surgery would be to either take that part out or to fix it and repair the tear. So I hope that this was helpful in explaining what's going on with a meniscal tear. I know that this was pretty long, but I really, really wanna make sure everybody is on the same page of what parts of the menisci are vascularized, which ones aren't, because this is where the boards can easily trip you up. And if you don't know it, you're looking at this question, you're like, uh. So meniscal tears will show up on the exam. They're super common in clinical practice understanding what's going on with those. Again, thank you for your time, guys. I always appreciate doing these with you and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care, everybody.